So I'm really excited to tell you guys about our, the work from the Almost Matching Exactly Lab that we've been doing. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of background on how I ended up working on this project and how I got here and why I'm even talking here. Um, so my first real job after my postdoc ended was to rank all of the manholes in Manhattan in order of their probability to explode. Now, I know like that this is actually, I'm completely serious, that was actually my job. Um, I was doing that to support the power company and help them with predictive maintenance. So um, this is an example of the kind of events we were trying to prevent. Um, these events are very often caused by insulation breakdown on the low voltage cables that go um, that that go into the manholes, but they go along every avenue and every street in the city, and the manholes are, are access points to these electrical cables. And um, sometimes the salt from the road, um, you know, that they put to prevent the snow, seeps into the manholes, and then that breaks down the insulation. That causes short circuits, and then you get these fires and explosions and smoking manholes. Um, and our job was to, like I said, to try to prevent these from happening. And we had um, this. This is just a sorry. This is just a um, an overhead shot from one of our visualization tools that shows kind of how dense the manholes really are in Manhattan. Like this is just one street corner, and there's manholes kind of all over it. Okay, so the data that we were working with for this project was very, very. Um, it was just crazy to work with it. It was, you know, uh, underground cable data, manhole data, inspections data, um, and events data. And events data is like, you know, trouble tickets and very, very difficult to work with text documents. Um, and um, our job was to help prioritize the inspections um, to try to prevent these fires and explosions by having the power company go and inspect the most vulnerable manholes first. Okay, so. Um, this is Steve, uh, Steve Yerum. He was the the most senior power engineer we worked with. He was very stern. I tried to draw that, like, I don't know if you can tell, I was trying to draw him being really stern there. And so at some point he said, how much, well, how much are we saving by prioritizing inspections? And um, our response was, hmm, um, we're not sure. We better figure out how impactful your inspections program is. So, you know, if you inspect a manhole, how much does that, um, how much does it impact the probability that that manhole is going to have a serious manhole event like a fire or explosion? And so we ended up writing a paper about this. Um, and in this paper, we tested whether repairs carried out in response to inspections have a positive impact on the health of manholes. Anyway, so while we were doing this, I realized that causal inference is actually really complicated. Uh, what people would like to do is you'd, you'd just love to, in, to take the manholes that have been inspected and compare them to the manholes that have not been inspected and look and see if there was a difference in outcomes. But you can't do that because the, there's a policy for inspections. And, you know, the manholes that were inspected already by the power company, they would have been more vulnerable than manholes that weren't inspected. And so you can't just look at the difference in outcomes between these two sets of manholes. You actually have to do some work to undo the, the bias caused by the current policy on inspections. And so you, what we could do is try matching. So we could try to, for every manhole that's inspected, um, we might try to find a similar manhole that's not inspected. But um, that's, I mean, typically when people do matching, they do kind of weird stuff that doesn't make any sense. Like they'll take a whole population of manholes, they'll project them down to one dimension, they'll match in that one dimension. That's called propensity score matching. And it, you know, when you do the kind of stuff that people often do um, for matching, it's really unclear whether you can actually trust the results, especially when you're projecting everything down to one dimension and your matches don't make too much sense. Um, you know, it would be really nice to actually inspect the match groups and determine whether you missed a potential confounder. So kind of go into more detail on on the construction of these match groups. And then, you know, how do you how can you double check that your matches are actually high quality matches? And so that's why we ended up doing to doing exact matching. We want to try to match as as exactly as possible so that we can answer all of these questions, like dig down into the go down into the data and try to check everything carefully. So that's why this lab exists. And there are three uh, professors involved in this. Uh, it's me and Sudipa Roy and Alex Volfovsky, and we've been working 
on this for four four years now, I think, maybe four and a half at this point. So our, our kind of um, uh, most important algorithm is called FLAME. FLAME is fast, large scale, almost matching exactly. And the two important points about FLAME are that every treated unit is matched to at least one control unit exactly on as many important covariates as possible. So you try to try to match exactly on as many important covariates as possible. And then furthermore, every unit is matched on a set of covariates that together can be used to predict the outcome well. Okay, so um, here's an example of a good match. So let's say I'm trying to predict a future stroke in medical patients. And I'm going to match them. This is a particularly good match group because they're both in the same age bin. Um, they both had a past stroke. They both had hypertension. They both have had congestive heart failure. However, they don't match on whether they have long toenails. But you know what? It doesn't matter because long toenails is actually not really, it's not useful at all for predicting future stroke. So we actually, actually don't care about um, toenails. And so that's why we think this is a good match because this is an exact match on a set of covariates that together can be used to predict the outcome well. Now, this is an example of a bad match because even though um, they agree on a bunch of these features, they actually don't agree on age. And age is actually really, really important for predicting the outcome. And so um, this is actually not a good match. So we want every unit to be matched in a good match, in a good matched group. Okay, so how do we know which variables are important? And the answer is that uh, we use machine learning on a training set to figure out which, which variables are important. So we take our data set, we hold um, part of it out as a training set, and use that on that training set, we figure out which variables are important. And then we make sure to match on those important variables. And that makes sure that the matches are accurate or lead to accurate estimates of conditional average treatment effects. Um, the algorithm is very scalable because it uses fast bit vector calculations and database algorithms to compute matches on a whole database very, very quickly. And in fact, it can even compute matches on databases uh, on, on, on databases that don't fit into main memory. So it's actually that, that level of scalability. And then also the matches are interpretable because they're almost exact. They match on a set of covariates that together can predict the outcome well. So it's this combination of having accurate matches, scalable matches, and interpretable matches that really um, allow Flame to, to be um, you know, more competitive than the other algorithms for, exact, for, for matching, for almost exact matching. Um, we actually have four different software packages, so Flame is one of them. There's also uh, algorithms called Dame Flame. So Dame is actually more exact than Flame, um, but it's, it's a bit slower because it's doing kind of a combinatorial search for different, um, different combinations of features that can predict the outcome well together. So Flame uses backward elimination while Dame is trying to do this more combinatorially hard problem. And so it's slower, but, um, but it gives you more exact matches than Flame. So what we typically do is we start with Flame and try to you know, eliminate irrelevant covariates until the point where we can use Dame and get really high quality matches. Um, we also have an algorithm called MALTS, which stretches the covariate space and can do um, continuous, handle continuous covariates a bit better. And then there's a, another package called Adaptive Hyperboxes that creates these like little boxes in, in, um, in feature space and matches based on those hyperboxes. So that's, that's all I, I had to say today. Um, if you feel like you want to test uh, your, you know, whether a treatment is effective, any kind of treatment, it can be for power grid reliability or healthcare or anything else, then you are certainly welcome to come to our website and try out our algorithms and um, give us some feedback. And if you have any run into any trouble, we will be happy to help you. Biz Yoder is, is curious, how did you define uh, what are important variables? We actually take part of the data set and hold it out as a training set. And then on that training set, we use that to predict outcomes. And so we actually know which variables are important for predicting outcomes because we're using that training set to figure that information out. And then once you have those important variables, you take those and you match exactly on the matching set. I think that's, that's helpful. Um, Next question that's come up is, is you know, how, how are you accommodating um, unobservable features? And um, does this face the same issue as other matching methods um, in terms of not 
necessarily yeah. matching the other unobserved goals. Yeah, so we have exactly that. The, the problem with unmeasured confounding, it's exactly the same as for other methods. We, we assume no unmeasured confounding. However, we have extended um, our frameworks, uh, FLAME in particular, to the case where you have, um, where some of the typical assumptions are violated. So, for instance, if you have an instrumental variable, something called an instrumental variable, there is a version of FLAME for instrumental variables. Um, so, in that case, you can have unobserved confounding as long as one of these instrumental variables exists. And then we also have a version of FLAME that works with what's called network interference, where people are collect connected along a network and you want, to, um, you want to estimate treatment effects. And that's useful for things like determining uh, how useful a treatment is for preventing COVID or something like that, or the flu where you have people talking to each other in a network and one person's, um, one person's outcome affects another person's treatment, like whether they were exposed to the flu because the other person got a flu shot. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, th we, we can um, violate certain assumptions, but again, if you have unmeasured confounding, um, then you're, you're, you know, you're in trouble unless you have like an instrumental variable. Um, one helpful thing about interpretability is that you can, if you don't know you're missing a variable, an important variable, you can dive down into the match group and say, should these guys really be matched? Or am I missing an important variable? Hmm. Maybe I better add that variable in. That, that, that makes sense. Um, Billy Pizer's curious, you know, looking about, looking at um, variables, predicting treatments and, and whether that makes sense versus looking at variables, you know, related to the outcome. Yeah, we, we looked at this specifically. And um, in fact, if you have a variable that, how do I say this? The, the only way we've found that it's useful to know who's been treated, like what to, to predict the treatment, like to predict propensity, is to make sure that there's overlap between the treatment and control groups. Because if you have no overlap, like if you have all the treated people are, are over here and the control people are over here, and there's like some part of the space where there's no overlap, then you can't estimate treatment effects. You just can't. Um, and so using propensity just to make sure that overlap is OK, that's great. But we have other ways of checking overlap instead of looking at propensity. So we actually use only an outcome model on the training. OK. Um, and going back to the first question, a, a little bit of a clarification. Um, the, the asker is, is curious which method you used for important variables, um, such as mini coefficient or mean decrease um, in accuracy. So I use, I, I particularly like decrease in accuracy. So I, I use something called model reliance, which came out of Random Forest and Leo Bryman. Um, and essentially you take your model, you, you, run, you, you run machine learning, you, you take your model and, um, well, actually, sorry, for, for what we do, um, you, you take your model. Um, sorry, let me just make sure I got this right. So actually, never mind. So with Flame, what we do is we just, we take the variable out and re, we refit it. So you can see how important, yeah. So if the variables, if the variables, not important, then you can take it out and refit the model, and nothing right. bad happens. And so that's that's how we determine, yeah. So it's it, that simple. There's nothing nothing complicated about that's it. That's great. Um, yeah. And uh, somebody's curious, how does Flame compare to previous algorithms, both in terms of matching quality and speed? So it's it's. What's really great is that it's amazing in terms of both of those two things, and that's where, why, why we're so excited about it. it. It actually gets up to the level of accuracy of something like causal BART, which is the best, but BART is, sorry, Bayesian Additive Regression Trees. That's the best algorithm right now for causal inference um, in machine learning. It's a black box, it's super complicated, but it really gives you the best predictions. And um, Flame is you know, up to that level. It's, it's that accurate, it's that good. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't require sort of manual intervention, like uh, there's a method called course and exact matching where you actually have to manually course in the space. The problem with doing that, of course, is that it involves a human designing a high dimensional distance metric, which we know humans are not really good at designing high dimensional functions in their heads. Um, and it's, it's much more competitive than things like genetic matching or propensity score matching where uh, the, they're not even trying to get really good high quality match groups. They're just, 
they're you know projecting onto a lower dimensional space and matching on that space so you can have units that are nothing like each other being matched to each other in these algorithms and so when you look at conditional average treatment effects they're all over the place they're like random guesses they're just garbage so um yeah we have a lot of really great comparisons in our paper uh, that you can you can totally check out and um and see for yourself what the what the other methods are doing yeah we're great doing. and and Pivoting a little bit to applications, has, has Flame or, or, or Dame been used in practice? And um, if so, anything you learned from it? And I'll add to this, um, anything particular related to the to the energy sector, if, if at all? Yeah, we've been trying. Um, so we, we've been mostly, to be honest, we've been mostly developing these algorithms because it's a lot of work to develop these things and make sure the code is high quality. And, you know, we have programmers and students testing them. We have students building um, tutorials and, you know, the website and so on and so forth. So it was quite a lot of work to set it up. Um, the one thing about doing exact matching and, and making your model interpretable is that you realize what problems you have with your data set. So every time we pick up a data set, we go and use it. And half the time we're like, wow, this data set's crap. We can't use this anymore. <laughs> so the some of the major, like kind of the one major successful experiment we've done is on um, some healthcare data. And we, we were able to figure out that this is a, like a, a giant healthcare data set, and um, it's about uh, whether smoking causes smoking in a pregnant woman causes um, effects on the the baby. Um, and what we found is that the data set is not as good as we thought for what people are typically using it for. Um, so that's an issue. Uh, yeah, but we have had people try it on on energy applications, but nothing nothing major has come out of it so far. I wish I wish something had. So if anyone in the audience wants to try it for any energy application, I would strongly encourage you to do it. <laughs>